What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Point Forward the Podcast. Myself, Andre Gadala, along with my main man, Evan Turner. E.T. is uh, out, with, out from us today. Um, he had a uh, loss in the family, but uh, he'll be back soon. So prayers uh, to him, his family, uh, condolences. Uh, we wish you, my brother. Uh, but today we have a um, very interesting uh, guest. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, I've been really into this space for uh, the last two or three years and he's done some amazing things, um, you know, not just in his space, but also uh, in the world of uh, philanthropy and giving back. Uh, yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, founder and CEO of FTX, um, the crypto exchange, um, Mr. Sam Bankman Fry. Sam, welcome to the show. We appreciate you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, where are you coming from? Um, where are you headquartered right now? I'm in the Bahamas right now in Nassau. Oh, you're in the Bahamas. So that's where the headquarters are for FTX, correct? That's where international headquarters are. U.S. headquarters are in Chicago. Chicago. I'm from Springfield, Illinois. So a little bit of, I uh, spent a good amount of time. So I, I would love to come explore uh, the spot in Chicago. Uh, why the Bahamas? Yeah, and basically you, we were looking for like where the right place was to have the international uh, you know, headquarters, and we're looking at what's a place that has cryptocurrency regulation that has licensure, um, you know, for a business, that's a, a really nice place to be supportive government, and really convenient. Um, and, you know, sort of narrowed down the list pretty quickly in the Bahamas was, you know, towards the top of all of them. Um, so, you know, checked out last year and ended up moving here. So let's go back, you know, um, how did this all start? And I don't mean just, you know, how did you get into the crypto space? I know uh, a little bit about, you know, Alameda research, you know, a little bit about, you know, finding, you know, the inefficiencies within the market and, and then going over to, you know, Asia to kind of, you know, take advantage of that. But, and, and then I know a little bit about your altruism, which we'll get into a little bit, um, but let's go all the way back to the beginning and how, you know, uh, how you became who you are today, starting with your parents. You know, I heard, I know poor parents came from uh, Stanford as law professors and kind of what were some of the um, principles or morals or values that you were given at a young age that kind of molded you to who you are today? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a really fortunate, you know, upbringing and they weren't extremely prescriptive, you know, they didn't sort of like tell me exactly what to think or, or how to think. Um, but I got a lot of exposure, um, you know, really early on to, uh, you know, both sort of how, you know, law school professors thought about things, how their friends thought about things, um, you know, to legal and uh, policy points of view, the political sphere. But on top of that, you know, in the end, they cared about figuring out how they could, you know, have the most impact and do the most good in the world. And so that was always something that was uh, sort of on the back of my mind growing up. So what were some of the uh, books you read or was it just general conversations you were having with your parents? But what, like, what, was, what was the main uh, focus or guide throughout you know, uh, the day in the life of, of a SBF, as they call you? Yeah, so most of it was, uh, was conversations. You know, they'd have people, you know, friends and colleagues over for dinner. Um, and I would sort of listen into those conversations. Um, and, and that was a lot of it. Uh, you know, as I grew older, I started to explore more, you know, a lot of this, frankly, was reading Wikipedia, um, you know, and reading various blogs and starting to, you know, explore topics that they talk about and, you know, do more research on them. Uh, and, and then just bounce ideas off of them. Um, but, but I think up until college, I was very much in a sort of like initial exploratory phase and not really thinking about you know, activating at all what I'd been, uh, you know, what I'd been thinking about. Gotcha. So were there any pressures, you know, you know, we go through this as athletes getting into first generation wealth and, you know, how do we raise our children and the pressures of, of being a, the, the child of an athlete, were there any pressures of being a child of, of Stanford law professors? There's a, a little bit that I put on myself. Like I definitely, you know, growing up just sort of assumed without particular reason that like I should be an academic growing up. Um, but they, they were careful not to specifically exert, you know, pressures on me. And, and, you know, they, they didn't at all argue that I should be a lawyer or anything. 
uh, you know, when, 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 when I grew up and, you know, we're, we're totally open to me exploring. So. So, so we fast forward and you choose MIT, you know, as always, that's always been a fascinating um, acronym to me. And, and I've never quite got a chance to really deep dive and understand, you know, uh, why people choose MIT. So help me. Why MIT? Yeah. So this was, um, I, you know, this is coming about, I, uh, as I was, you know, in senior year of college, or high school, rather trying to explore what I want to do next. And I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I, I sort of assumed that maybe I would be a professor in, I don't know, math or, or physics or something uh, without, without having much reason for that. It was just sort of my default assumption given, uh, you know, what my parents were, but um, I, but what did happen uh, as I explored was it became clear to me that it was going to be really important who I was with in college, like which people I was around, what environment I was around. And, you know, the truth is when you look at a lot of the top colleges, they're pretty similar in terms of the, co the like classes that you can take, the majors that you can have. Um, that, that would not have varied much from place to place. Um, but the thing that was pretty different, you know, at, at MIT and at Caltech, which is the other place I was looking, was that it had a, a very, uh, you know, tech focused culture, um, you know, fairly nerdy culture, a, a very academic culture relative to, uh, you know, the average place. And those all really appealed to me. Um, and, you know, it felt like a place where I could really, uh, you know, find a lot of people who I really enjoyed being around. And that was really why I, I chose it. So was the the foundation of altruism, which is, you know, give me a, give us the definition of altruism and then how that came into play. And, you know, we'll go from there. Totally. So this was something, you know, in theory, uh, for much of my life, that was important to me, like, like in, in some sort of, uh, irrelevant, but, I uh, but, you know, personally meaningful sense. Um, I, I, I always felt like, you know, I would want to try and do important things for the world. And you know, do what was whatever was important for the world, um, but that's obviously very vague. And um, I didn't have any idea really what that would mean to put it into practice. You know, what that would actually mean day to day, um, or in terms of my career. And I just didn't even think about that really until until I was in college. Um, when I did, I, I eventually discovered you know a movement called effective altruism. And 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 the basic sort of theory behind it is, uh, look, you know there are a lot of things you can do with your life. Um, and, you know, one thing that you could choose to do is think about, you know, what can you do in terms of making the world better? Um, and that's the thing a lot of people are thinking about when they're choosing their career, at least it's some part of the picture for a lot of people, you know, they want to have a career that is, uh, you know, helpful for the world, that's productive, uh, that's positive. Um, but what very few people do is think really carefully about, you know, how they can maximize that positive impact is think about not just, you know, which are careers that will be positive instead of negative, uh, but think about, you know, what are careers that I should consider if my goal is to have as much positive impact as I can, you know, if maximizing that is really where I'm, I'm coming from. Um, and, and, and that serves the foundation of, of, of effective altruism is, you know, given the constraints that, that you're going to have, whatever they end up being, you know, what should you do to, you know, maximize your, your, your ultimate positive impact on the world. And, um, you know, I, I started exploring a lot more, you know, over the course of my first few years in college and realizing that it really had pretty significant implications um, for how I should spend my life and that, you know, I'd sort of been ignoring those, but that they mattered. Um, and that uh, it was sort of time for me to take seriously, like rethinking what my career should be with you know, doing good, not just as like a sort of binary factor of does it do some good, but as a primary factor. So that's a pretty young age to have all that, you know, going on in your mind. Is that the norm at a place like MIT or did you have to search for like-minded individuals? You know, kind of talk to me how you set up the, the community you started to grow with in college. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think what I would say is, you know, you can sort of break effective altruism down into the two words, if you want, you know, effectiveness and altruism, right? And it's it's thinking about how do you take altruistic instincts and then try and be as you know, effective at them as possible. And the effectiveness part was actually, was sort of the norm at MIT. Like, you know, MIT as a place was 
you know, very concerned with, you know, whatever you're doing, how can you be efficient and effective at it? Um, but not so much in terms of the altruistic piece. And that's not to say it was like an anti-altruistic school, but, you know, most people there weren't thinking about, you know, how could they have, you know, the most positive impact with their career, you know, to the extent they want to have positive impact, they're actually kind of into maximizing it. Um, but that was just, you know, one of many, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, criteria that they're sort of vaguely considering on average. Um, and so, you know, what I guess I found in the end was that, you know, people were very sympathetic to it there, um, you know, to um, thinking about, you know, impact from a quantitative angle and, and really trying to go deeper than just having some positive impact. Um, but that, you know, in terms of actually making that a priority, um, that was something that, you know, to some extent I built out, you know, the community they're around me, to some extent, friends built that out with me. And, you know, I met people in, in a similar position who were excited to sort of explore, um, explore the world through a, a, you know, through altruistic standpoint, um, I, you know, during college. And, and those sort of dovetailed together. And, you know, ultimately, um, I, you know, spent a lot of time exploring that, you know, with, with the people I was living with and friends with. In college, but it was very much sort of a, a community, at least within the MIT context, that was of our own making. Um, but more globally, there was a you know quickly growing movement of people um, who were thinking about um, you know how to maximize their impact. And so, you know, more globally speaking, um, this was something that there was a, a a a big community you know eventually for. And I started to get to know. Uh, those people, I you know, met some of them when they visit, um, you know, Boston and talk with them about what I was going to do with my life. And, um, and that was ultimately how I did a lot of my exploration um, early on about what I should actually do. So you graduate college 2014, correct? And three years later, you start, you know, Alameda Research. Um, and before we get to Alameda Research, when did you... Uh, get interested into the crypto world? Yeah, so I was basically not paying any attention to crypto until 2017. Um, I, after college, I, well, I guess even before that, you know, I talked with a number of the people in the effective altruism community, other people I really respected about what I should do with my life. And, um, you know, the, the conclusion was maybe I should try earning to give, which is to say, you know, try seeing uh, how much I could, you know, get to be able to donate um, to great organizations. And, you know, where that came from basically was, you know, I talked to a number of the, uh, um, you know, of the, the charities I serve like most and said, look, would you prefer that I sort of like give you my time or, or my money? And, and they basically all said that they wanted my money, not, not my time, that, that I could have more impact donating to them. And, and, you know, a lot of that, that's not true of everyone, right? Like for some people, uh, time, but for me, I was in a really strong position to be able to uh, potentially donate a significant amount and much less a position uh, to be, you know, uniquely good at, you know, helping them build out their organization. I didn't have much background in, you know, community growth or, um, or philanthropy or anything. And, and so, um, so anyways, I was on Wall Street earning to give and, you know, ultimately decided, look, there are a lot of things I want to try doing with my life. Um, I, I don't know which is going to end up being most important. And it's very exploratory. Um, but that there's no point in sort of delaying that analysis, like, um, or delaying that exploration. You know, if I was going to try other things, I might as well jump into them. And so, so I left uh, my job and, you know, left not sure what I would ultimately end up focusing on. Um, but, you know, moved to California and, you know, among other things, I was trying out working at a foundation there. Um, but this is also when I started to get into crypto. And in particular, this is, this is late 2017, right? This is um, the first time that there's sort of a giant public, uh, you know, awareness of crypto it was when, you know, Bitcoin went from $3,000 to $20,000 in the course of like four months. And there was a huge, huge amount of attention on the space then. I mean, this is when you just like all of your friends were talking about it. And what that meant for me as I sort of eyed the space was um, it was a pretty strong sign that there was going to be a lot of demand 
um, for crypto, that there's going to be a lot of activity in crypto, um, a lot of volume, a lot of excitement. Um, I, and at the same time, uh, that it was probably going to be a really inefficient space. Um, that you know, there are sort of a lot of signs of like, look, none of the institutional liquidity providers are in this space yet. You know, we're not going to see like a really sophisticated, efficient market, but there is going to be a lot of volume and volatility, and you know, that often means that there's good trades to do. And when I first got into crypto, it was just numbers on the screen to me. Like I wasn't thinking of blockchains or Bitcoins. I didn't know what a Bitcoin was. Um, the only thing I was thinking of was, look, there are probably trades. Probably there's going to be one venue where Bitcoin's trading at seven thousand dollars, and another one where it's trading at seven thousand two hundred dollars. And I, uh, you know, there is a three percent arbitrage there, and theoretically, I can do a good trade. And um, and so I jumped into crypto with no idea what it was, as as a real asset class. Um, thinking that there might just be, um, you know, good trades to do. So we go to Alameda Research. Uh, that was your first company you started. Um, do you feel like you have to be a leader to be a founder of a company? Yeah, I, I, I do. And I don't think I knew that when I first founded a company. Like, I, I, I'm now aware of that. But the first thing that, well, okay, the first thing that I did when I started up Alameda, which is a, a crypto trading firm, um, was just to start to do trades and you know find good trades and just trade myself and it's like two people at time so it, it, you know it's, it's not clear who I was leading exactly right um, and you know that basically made it seem like like my sort of like early investigations that first of all there were definitely really good trades to do um, but that second of all um, I it was uh, going to be pretty hard to be able to do them. Um, that it was going to be pretty complicated, and um, I, I and and so you know basically where I ended up was uh, look like there's you know huge upside here, but we need to build out a bigger team. Like we need to build out um, a bigger operation, and the operational part of it really were a lot of the hard part, dealing with with wire transfers, bank accounts, and stuff. And so you know we grew from what like you know five people to ten people to fifteen people to twenty five people to ten people. And that last step probably tells you something about how the previous steps went. Um, I, and you know, I learned a lot of lessons through that first you know, six month period. Um, and one of them was exactly what you brought up around leadership that um, I hadn't been thinking about you know, running a business in terms of being a leader exactly. I'd been thinking of it in terms of, look, here are the important things that have to happen. Like I'm gonna work on a lot of them. I'm gonna hire other people who will work on them. And I'll give you know, thoughts and advice and you know, answer people's questions and help them to the extent I can. And, and sort of viewed it as you know, something a little bit more than an employee, um, you know, maybe like a, a project lead or something like that. Um, but, it, but I wasn't thinking about like management with like a capital M or like you know, team culture or what, what sort of you know, vision am I setting for the company, in fact, I had a little bit of disdain for those notions. I sort of felt like, look, these are just sort of like, you know, these like mottos that people use. They don't mean anything. Like, it's like, come on, we're just going to do the right thing, whatever it is. And like, I don't care like what words you want to ascribe to it. That that was sort of like my philosophy when I I first started up Alameda. I think that's what I learned as an athlete and as I got older is what leadership and culture really mean. And I think. You know, starting to get into the tech space and investing and talking to CEOs, talking to founders, doing fireside chats and trying to find the parallels between sports and tech. And there were so many. And when the, one of the main ones was um, the ego and the ego can be driven amongst the employees. And I thought that was just sports. So that's when I learned about the culture. I learned about leadership and not just in sports, but in other places as well, in terms of, you know, you might have to sacrifice on this project, but then you'll get, you know, the spotlight on another project. So it was all coming full circle. So, you know, just really, really refreshing to hear you say that in terms of, you know, not knowing and you don't have all the answers because, you know, I've been in similar positions. So, you know, fast forwarding to, you know, FTX, you know, what was the idea behind uh, FTX going into it coming out of Alameda Research? Yeah, totally. And, you know, the one last thing I'll say on, on, on their chip is, you know, I still feel like 
look, a lot of the things people do that they say is leadership is just slogans and it doesn't mean anything, like it's not helping, but it does really matter. And like setting the tone does really matter. And that doesn't mean you have to have a document, which is like, this is our tone. Our tone is about authenticity, leadership, and values or something like that. But it does mean that you have to have authenticity and you have to have leadership and you have to have values. So, you know, even if you don't sort of, you know, think about it in a slogan-based way, you know, as an underlying matter, you still do need to set the right tone for the company and you still do need to ultimately make sure the right thing happens whatever you can't say oh well that was some employee's fault like i tried you know they just screwed it up like no i screwed it up but i'm clear like it's not like i don't know did i get assigned to the wrong person like was this an impossible task so, like whatever it's my goal, job to anyway so you know <laughs> um I spent a year trading and other than learning about leadership and and uh which i, I learned a lot about um uh, i also learned a lot about the crypto ecosystem um but even before that, I learned a lot about the non-crypto ecosystem. I, I learned a lot about our traditional financial ecosystem. And something that became clear to me all of a sudden was why crypto existed in the first place. Because I, I didn't know that when I got into crypto, right? When I first got involved, there are just numbers on a screen. I had no idea what these things were. Um, um, but it quickly became clear that I was spending two-thirds of my time dealing with banks. And that's a little weird because this is a crypto trading firm, right? The whole point was that he's trading Bitcoin, but somehow most of our job didn't have to do with Bitcoin. You know, the hardest parts didn't have to do with the blockchain. The hardest parts were sending a wire transfer and getting a bank account. And that was shocking to me. Um, we tried at one point to like get an account to be allowed to trade stocks and futures. And that was an enormous hassle that we only kind of succeeded at. And and you take a step back, it's like, well, aren't markets supposed to be like these open agnostic order books where people can come to trade, not like a permissioned entity where like only, I don't know, like people with connections can trade? And the answer is, well, I don't know what they're meant to be, but it turns out that in terms of what they are, they are not open agnostic order books. Like they are very much um, uh, permissioned entities. And I didn't realize that for a while, um, but I... But it became clear to me how dysfunctional the traditional financial system was, how inequitable access really was, and how much I'd been taking for granted at Jane Street, where, you know, there is just a button for like, buy this stock. I just assumed that's how the world works. You know, people walk around with buy this stock buttons. But as it turns out, that, 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 that's not how the world works. As it turns out, there's like, you know, billions of dollars and like, tens of years that went into building up that button and abstracting away an unbelievably messy underlying system. And so, um, you know, I started to all of a sudden realize like, holy shit, like it is extremely difficult to operate in the traditional financial world. Um, and I, that, that was surprising to me, um, but, but it seemed true. And, and so anyway, where, you know, I, I started to gain appreciation for why crypto existed, appreciation for the fact that there was all of a sudden a, an asset class with actually equitable access, an asset class that you could actually get access to without needing to have connections. And one where transfers just worked and payments just worked and where you're able to take control of your wealth. So that was all of a sudden, like I, I started to, to actually get excited about the space itself, not just the trading of it. At the same time, um, it became clear that the actual trading venues that I were using were incredibly messy and that like they just didn't work very well and um you know there were a, a huge number of problems with these this is you know circa 2018 2019 um i and you know they would just crash whenever markets got volatile because they couldn't handle you know the uh the load um i there was no compliance department at many of these places and you know they were not exactly uh acting within the confines of how uh, the law anticipated one would. Um, and I, you know, you, you just start like exploring bits and pieces of the ecosystem. And it became clear that like, first of all, the exchanges were the heart of the ecosystem to a decent extent. Um, and second of all, they were completely dysfunctional. Um, and so I, you know, these were places making billions collectively each year um, that, were you know incredibly impactful and incredibly 
impactful for, you know, trying to build out a new financial system with equitable access um, with really cool ideas and poor execution. And, and so I basically felt like there's an opportunity there um, to uh, try to build out something better. And that's where, you know, FTX came from. It was, can we combine together a lot of the cool innovations of crypto market structure with a lot of the functionality and sort of like, you know, clean design um, uh, that, you know, we saw in traditional finance. You speak in, you're speaking beautiful music to my ears. Um, and, and for our listeners as well, trying to get into this space, you know, I had a funny, a very funny um, screenshot of a gentleman who got three texts from his mother. The first text was, uh, why did you have us invest in Ethereum? Uh, it was 3000 when you told us to buy it. Now it's a thousand. See, this is why we don't love you. <laughs> but there was an interesting article, you know, about uh, two weeks ago in terms of, you know, how African-Americans, you talk about uh, inequalities and, you know, um, you know, the world doesn't move the way you thought, just pushing the button. You know, there's a whole group of individuals um, who've never been able to participate um, in, in the, uh, the financial world, you know, in, in stocks and bonds, you know, in group economics. And they've always been at the bottom of the total pole. So you have a lot of African-Americans who are trying to get into this space. And, you know, we're usually the last to hear about something. And now we hit the crypto, uh, the crypto winner, as they're calling it. Um, so kind of give us your take into, you know, where we are now in terms of uh, the markets uh, with crypto. Totally. And, you know, one thing that, that I will note on your point is, you know, you would think and you would be correct that like the tech sector is overrepresented in crypto, that there's a lot of people from Silicon Valley there. That is true. But and I think this is surprising to some people. It certainly was surprising to me before I got into this space. Minorities are also overrepresented as are rural communities. And why is this, right? These are places that have not traditionally had equitable access to financial markets. These are places where it's been really hard to get real functional bank accounts, um, to get good brokerage accounts, to get you know good access to systems. And all of a sudden, for the first time, you have this open network where you know everyone can have the same level of access that you know Citadel and um, and Jane Street could, could have. And that, that, that is pretty revolutionary for, for a, a lot of people who haven't had that opportunity before. And, and so, um, you know, that was something which I think it surprised me to, to learn, but the more time I've spent in this space, the more I've understood why, why that's true. Maybe, maybe one other thing on that, frankly, is this isn't even just a US thing, right? You look internationally at which places are overrepresented and what you end up finding is, well, how about countries with dysfunctional financial systems? right? A lot of representation there because this is one of the first times that they can get real access, right? Ukraine is um, overrepresenting in crypto right now because there are literally tanks outside their banks. Like they can't just, you know, just use a bank to, to, to do what, what, what they want to do. They need some digital global financial access. So in terms of like, where do I see things right now? Um, because obviously we are in, in, in a bear market right now. Um, the first thing that I think is worth noting is that this isn't a crypto specific bear market. Like we are in, in a bear market, that, that's certainly true. Um, for, for crypto, you know, Bitcoin is down what, like 65% or something like that from its peak. Um, but if you look at NASDAQ index, um, uh, it's down, you know, nearly 50% from, from it, its peak, right? It just all asset classes are down a lot. And, you know, the, the, the core trigger for this is uh, just monetary policy changes. You know, for a decade, um, the Fed had been, you know, running basically uh, really, uh, you know, soft money policies where it was, uh, you know, a lot of, frankly, a lot of inflation, um, you know, where there was, uh, you know, really, really low, uh, often literally zero interest rates. Um, and that caused a giant amount of money to enter the system. And a giant appreciation um, in assets that were um, I, I, that that you know you could invest in, and and that that was true of stocks. Um, that's true of crypto. It's true of you know everything from wine to boats um, to houses. Um, and we saw it massive inflation in these asset classes. You know over the last decade. Finally, this year, 
um, that started to trickle through to uh, consumer goods. And that was really impactful because among other things, first of all, it obviously just hit investors hard. But second of all, when you look at how we measure inflation, right? traditionally we look at, at CPI, um, and that's just looking at consumer prices. So CPI wasn't moving this whole time, even as all this money entered the world, so it was going through finance. As it trickles down and then you have supply chain disruptions from COVID and from the war in Ukraine, that sort of you know, dovetail um, with this, and all of a sudden um, you have the makings of um, you know, a huge increase in, in CPI inflation. You know, the Fed picks this up and starts to, uh, to dial up interest rates, dial down loans. And then a lot of money just rushes out of the system and asset prices fall. Crypto falls, stocks fall, everything falls. Um, and, you know, that, that's where we are today. Um, you know, in this process, it is also worth noting that, like, I, you know, we also did see, um, I, you know, at the same time, I, you know, a fair bit of uh, risk management uh, philosophies play out and, you know, so, some of them in a more healthy way than others. And, you know, there are a lot of margin calls. Um, some uh, some entities blew out uh, pretty spectacularly. And, you know, that certainly exacerbated the fall a bit, right? Like if you look at the fall from like $25,000 to $20,000 per Bitcoin, a lot of that was margin calls. Um, and so now, you know, where does that leave us going forward? Um, as far as I know, and you know, I, I can't be 100% confident in this, but as far as I know, um, you know, there aren't like more shoes to drop in terms of lots of companies blowing out here. Um, obviously, anything could happen, but um, but things seem moderately stable um, as of today. Um, and uh, and so, you know, going forward, um, I, I think that like a lot of what's going to happen is going to depend on just general economic factors, right? Like, you know, what happens to the stock market? What happens to inflation? What happens to interest rates? What does the Fed do? Um, what happens in Ukraine? Like all of those things are, are going to matter and they're going to flow through the economy more generally. And I think that's what's going to determine, you know, where things go short term from here. Long term, obviously, you know, what's going to matter the most is what actually happens in the ecosystem. Do people build great products, right? Like that ultimately is going to be what matters the most um, even if it's on sometimes a fairly law, you know, large lag from uh, from prices. So I, I was having a really good. Uh, I was working out with my trainer this morning. You know, just trying to keep the um, trying to keep the body going. You know, I want to have really good early morning workouts. The day seems to flow well. And one of the questions uh, we start talking about crypto, and uh, she was saying, you know, it's not even a real thing. And you know, I was explaining to her how there's actually, you know, um, you know, when you mine crypto, you know, there's actually a lot of energy that goes into that. You know, that makes it a real thing. And she says, wait, it's real. It's, it's like it's being made. And I said, no, it actually stamping on a ledger, you know, that's actually your receipt is there for forever. That's your ownership. That's your proof of stake. And, you know, just trying to explain that and, and going crypto one on one, you know, at its core, can you explain to us what crypto is and what it's trying to solve for? Totally. And, and obviously it's worth noting that crypto can be a bunch of different things. And, you know, stable coins and Bitcoin have, you know, somewhat different use cases from each other at its core, you know, one of the things that, that that crypto is is it's a way to um, tokenize assets, and that's obviously what happened with Bitcoin. Was you had a natively digital asset that anyone could get access to, and anyone could easily transfer to each other. Um, and you know, you can think of it a little bit like gold, but you don't have to deal with gold bars, um, and um, uh, and and sort of like you know, with, with much much cleaner, easier access, and with like a full auditable transaction history. Um, that that's one side of it. Another side of it um, is the blockchain, is the underlying networks, which which are are, are really cool. And and what they are is, uh, among other things, um, a way to have a full network where anyone can come and open an account. Anyone can send assets to anyone else instantly, cheaply, fully online with the click of a button. Full ledger history of all of this. It's sort of the perfect payment network to some extent, and it's uh, and, and what it also gets around is this question of like, well, which government is the government that sort of like, you know, I uh, uh, censors this network? The answer is 
well, it, it's actually an open network. In fact, it's fully international um, in a way that, you know, basically no other ones are today, uh, which, which I think is, is, is pretty cool. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, if you look at remittances where, you know, fees are insanely high uh, and it can take long amounts of time. And that's if your money doesn't get stolen halfway, uh, you know, through the process, which is, you know, always, always a risk. Um, it's, it's just like a massively cleaner and easier way um, to, to do remittances as well. And so I think it's, um, you know, the payment network vision of this, I think is, is a pretty compelling one. Um, and then, you know, other ones, well, you can tokenize of anything, right? And, and the dollar is one example, right? You know, there are tokens on the blockchain backed by the dollar one to one. And now all of a sudden you can take, you know, the stability of the dollar, if that's what you want, but still move it easily on, uh, on chain. And, and that, that, that's super powerful. Um, and so, you know, you can do that with other things, with real estate, you can do that with stocks. Um, you can do that with ownership of items and, you know, start to, to, to bring these advantages of easy transfer, clear ownership, fully digital, um, full, full transparency uh, to, you know, whatever assets you want to be tokenizing. And, and ultimately, I think that like it's combining together those properties that sort of give it, you know, the, the bulk of its power. So let's talk about the inefficiencies. You know, I was just talking about, you know, uh, folks who just got in, don't quite understand it, and they the timing's just off, and then they want to get out at a loss instead of just riding through. Um, and then we could talk about, you know, uh, Terra USD or, or Luna uh, or some of the, you know, a lot of the bad projects. You know, a lot of folks first time getting into the crypto space was through NFTs, and you know, to get an NFT, you know, you got you got to get a Coinbase, or you got to be on, uh, you know, any of the the trading platforms to get Ethereum. Um, and then once you get Ethereum, you got to get a MetaMask wallet. You got to transfer them to the MetaMask wallet. And then you're able to, you know, the gas fees. People are learning about the gas fees. Then you got, you know, and then you got uh, other currencies who don't have ca gas fees but don't quite have the uh, efficiencies of an Ethereum. Um, so there, there's so much to unpack. Um, in terms of the inefficiencies and, you know, the bad projects, you know, how do we become more informed um, of, the, of the bad actors in the space? And then we got a big security issue as well with people's wallets being emptied um, through different hacks, you know, kind of walk us through, you know, uh, what your vision is of, of, of how do we make these uh, places a little bit more safe and, and get everyone the knowledge to be able to operate safely in the space as well. Totally. You know. Some of this is going to have to come bit by bit, but there are some things that we can do to really help out here. Um, you know, one of these things is getting some regulatory oversight. There has not been regulatory clarity in crypto, and this both means that there hasn't been full access in the United States, that the Americans get a fraction of the space that all other countries get. But at the same time, it means that there is no clear, um, you know, cop on the beat for some parts of the crypto space in the United States. And that, you know, instead of having um, I, you know, instead of having sort of, you know, worlds where, uh, you know, things get vetted and then are available to, uh, to Americans, you have sort of the worst of all worlds where, you know, either you can't offer something at all, or you can offer whatever you want with no oversight. Um, and, uh, to many answers of like where exactly the ecosystem you are. So, you know, in terms of customer protection, and transparency, right. One of the big things is having you know regulatory mandated vetting of projects um and transparency around exactly what projects are um you know to, to be offered um which could help clean up a lot of the scams and 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 provide some transparency and clarity um and comfort uh to users you know some of this is the space cleaning itself up um you know self police policing um and you know that's going to be important as well um and you know, some of this is, you know, just building out stronger, better, clearer communities that can help teach people about the space in, you know, without preying on them and, and making sure that people, you know, are learning from good you know, materials and experts and well-meaning communities rather than from people trying to show their own product. Um, and so I think, you know, those are all going to be pieces that hopefully can come together to create a uh, you know a, a cleaner ecosystem.
But you talk about, you know, uh, centralization versus decentralization. Um, should there be government oversight? You know, and, and that's the part where, you know, I struggle to try to get a proper understanding. Not even a proper understanding because I understand both sides. But I did hear something quite interesting. You know, there does have to be uh, some sort of uh, centralization within decentralization. Uh, I guess my question to you is, should it be on the front end or on the back end when you scaled it out to, you know, the masses? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I don't know the answer for sure, but I can tell you the answer as far as, as you know, my instincts are. And some of these, these are things we're still going to have to learn. You know, these are things that are still unfolding. But my instinct is that to the extent that there is, you know, oversight and centralization, you want that focusing on the front end. You want that focusing on the you know interfaces that are selling things to retail customers, um, you know controls around those being transparent, being truthful, um, and 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 responsible and appropriate. Um, but that you want the back end, you know, more so to be able to operate efficiently, cleanly, and in instantly, so that you don't hold up, you know, the whole system, um, so that the system can actually you know continue to to operate quickly. Right, it, it's one of these things where you know one of the problems that I think we made with um, fiat transfers today, which was just like wire transfers, is we put the oversight in the back end as much as the front end, and so you know it's not just that like you know before you can ultimately you know uh, uh, you know offer products or, or use funds you know from your account there there has to be you know some oversight, but that if you just want to send your assets from like one bank account of yours to another, that might get held up by like third or fourth parties in the middle. We're trying to understand the entire situation in order to diligence it. You get like lots of different parties trying to compliance diligence every transfer and it's just, it's not practical. Like they don't even know who you are. You don't even have an account with them. They're just an intermediary bank, right? And all of a sudden you're in a world where you're trying to send a remittance back home to someone without the same name as you in a different country in a different currency. And like you felt like this random bank in like Lithuania, which is like, holding it up for a week because they're trying to figure out why you're transferring this and if there's something nefarious going on and there's no way for them to figure it out. And, and it, it means that, you know, just transfers sort of wholesale don't work very well. Um, and I think that like, instead we should be focusing on, you know, concentrating the roadblocks in the places that they're most important to be um, and letting the back end system operate quickly and efficiently. Beautiful, beautiful. This is like sweet jazz. Um, you FTX has leaned heavily on, um, you know, on the sports scene, you know, you've seen it everywhere. Super Bowls, you know, uh, Miami Heat, where I used to be, that announcement was made uh, like halfway through um, my last year with the Heat, uh, the the arena naming rights, you know, Cal Berkeley football field. Um, I saw the logo on uh, the MLB umpires. I thought that was really cool. Uh, F1 I've gotten into. I see the sponsorships there. Um, we've been talking about uh, crypto a whole lot. Uh, not crypto. I'm sorry. Cricket. Cricket a lot on the podcast in terms of how his growth in India, especially. Um, and then Tom Brady obviously has really leaned in. Uh, I think Steph Curry's doing some things with you as well in terms of uh, being ambassadors. Uh, you know, why have you leaned so much uh, in the sports world? Yeah, I think part of this is you look at, you know, what is our goal? First of all, if our goal was to sign up as many users as, as possible tomorrow, right? We do what the standard top company does and just like flood Facebook with that. Right, that that's like that 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 is the sort of tried and true method for like mass user acquisition. Um, that is not what we've been focusing on, and that's not been the sort of primary goal of our sports partnerships. The primary goal has been focusing on how do we, you know, convey who we are as a company. How do we raise awareness about ourselves in the industry, and you know, I start moving moving forward in terms of. Um, you know, what our networks are and, and how people see us. And, and I think that from that perspective, you know, we're looking at, look, where are the places that have huge amounts of following that have, you know, lots of people care about um, that are sort of universal um, and that are excited to partner with us. And, and I think that, you know, we're open to a lot of areas, but in practice, sports has been a lot of that. You know, in practice, you know, sports is, it is, you know, one of the few universal uh, quantities. And, and so it's been a great way to sort of convey our messages. Yeah, I, I always see sports as, you know, the has become the true community, 
you know, uh, hopefully we don't fragment too far apart with our factions and hatred for one another and rivalries, but there's true community in sports that I'm really enjoying uh, uh, seeing. Um, and then, you know, with a lot of athletes are starting to get into investing as well. You know, you're starting to see them have you know, real equity, uh, whether it be with tech companies, whether it be with consumer products and goods, you're seeing the, uh, it's the, the new endorsement, you know, no longer someone paying to use your likeness uh, or you to speak for the company, but you know, there's an equity stake in there in there now. We're always been talking about on the pod transaction, you know, versus equity. Sometimes transactional piece might be worth more than equity, and sometimes equity might be more than transaction, depending on who you know who you're working with. But we're seeing athletes get smarter and get smarter. And I think we're starting to see it within tech company as well. You know, you take a large check from a VC firm and then you grow from there, and then that was it. But now you're seeing uh, actual companies start their own ventures within the company. And, you know, obviously you just unveiled uh, FTX Ventures, uh, which is a $2 billion fund. You know, uh, what is it and, and, and how different is it from uh, FTX itself? Yeah, so, you know, there are a few different pieces of it. And one piece which I'll sort of separate out is, you know, when we think about, um, you know, how do we uh, grow FTX the business, right? And are there sort of value creative acquisitions that we can make, you know, ways that we can grow stronger together? That's one sort of separate piece of this, but but putting that aside for a second and, and instead thinking about, you know, the more venture piece of this, you know, there's a lot in common with traditional venture funds, but there's some ways that we try to do things a bit differently. Um, I think, you know, one of these is, uh, you know, that we try and think about this in terms of, you know, ultimately what will help these projects. And, you know, obviously we, we you know, started a company, we, we've gone through that. You know, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of experience about how to, uh, you know, build companies. And one of the things we've learned is that sometimes people think they're trying to help, but they're not helping, right? It's really easy for outside parties to come in and bulldoze their way through a company without much of the context and just give sort of like stock standard management advice in a way which maybe it's helpful in some contexts, but like in most it isn't. And you sort of like have to identify like, is this actually the thing that this company needs to hear right now? Is this actually the useful thing? So one thing is we, we, we want to stay out of the way if we're not going to be helping. Like, you know, we, the last thing we want to do is, is hurt the companies that, that, that we've invested in. Um, and we've seen a lot of companies which really struggled because of bad advice from investors and, you know, which are now in uh, pretty uh, tough positions in terms of, uh, you know, in, in terms of like what their finances look like. So they, they massively overhired. And, and um, so that's one piece, piece of it. Second piece, obviously, to the extent that our knowledge or network or relationships can be useful, we're super happy to help, you know, our, uh, I, you know, help, help out our portfolio companies with theirs. Um, and, uh, you know, we try and be really, you know, efficient, move quickly, and not hold things up on dumb shit. And, you know, what, what I mean by that is, look, like, if the terms feel like overall good to us, we don't have anything prescriptive about what has to be in the terms of our investment. We're not going to be arguing for like, well, we need to protect our downside. Like, that's not the point of an investment. Like, the point of an investment is we're taking downside in return for helping the company grow. If we want to put terms in there, but also we can't lose money, then like, I don't know, why would someone want our investment? You know, it's, and we're not, you know, we're in the business of like trying to help people out and take some risk doing so. Now, is there a piece of Innovator's Dilemma behind that? And what I mean by Innovator's Dilemma, you know, was a really interesting book that I read in terms of, you know, companies, you know, they start off with a product and they build that product and then they become successful and then they get caught up in their success and they don't see threats coming. And in order to see a threat coming, um, you have to be aware of the scene. You have to, you know, have eyes in other places and then you might see a threat coming. And in order to beat that, you might have to start a company within the company. But then if you're a public company, you have a fiduciary responsibility, you know, to to your shareholders to increase the value of what you already started. And, and that's the safe bet. But you also have to take, like you said, your other bets to hold off someone that might be you know, coming in. And I think you're starting to see that with a lot of banks who are getting into the crypto space, which I'm a little weary of because, you know, then they'll the. the getting away from the banks was the point of crypto, of, of the blockchain space, but now they're trying to get into it. So, you know, is, is there an innovative dilemma uh, within, the, within the venture space in terms of, you know, seeing what's coming and then being able to integrate that into FTX? Yeah, I think there absolutely is. And, you know, we always want to be looking for it and we always want to be thinking about ultimately, where do we want to be? Ultimately, what product do we want to have and why? 
What's the important thing? And what do we need to do to get there from here? And 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 I think a big piece of this, which is something that, that you talked about, is like, look, there are a lot of goals you could have for the company. And one would be the sort of goal for like safety or something, right? And what does that mean? I, I mean, it, it's not totally clear, um, but but I, I think it means something like, look, don't do something unless it will definitely be good for the company, right? And, and I think that when you start talking about stakeholders, especially as a public company, that comes up a lot. I think it's dumb. I think it's really bad for companies because fundamentally, there's no really fundamental difference between doing something and not doing something. Like, it's not like it's virtuous to not do something if it's messy, um, but unvirtuous to do something that's, that, that, that's messy. Um, in the end, you have to make the best decisions you can, and there's always going to be trade-offs and, and pros and cons and uncertainty. And that means that sometimes in order to position yourself correctly, you have to take actions that might end up being dumb. You have to build products that you might not, not need in the end. Um, and you have to be willing to take some risks for the company um, and for the shareholders in order to hopefully be able to have you know, bigger gains from them. And you know, what that means is like not just focusing on short-term profit or short-term share price, but focusing on, you know, we're willing to give up some of our profit this year in return for what we think is in expectation most important for growing the company, even if we don't know for sure what is. And you will sometimes get stakeholders, so to speak. I hate the word stakeholder. As soon as you see stakeholders, you know there's a problem, right? As soon as that's how people are framing their spells, because they're not, the whole point of being a stakeholder is that you're not saying what's important for the thing I hold a stake in. You're saying what's important for me as a stakeholder. It's supposed to be aligned, right? They're all supposed to be, but but as soon as it gets framed that way, you're you're assuming the stakeholders have different incentives because they're not just trying to do what's right for the company. And then it becomes possible to do anything. You're stuck with inaction and hoping that inaction happened to be the correct decision. And sometimes it will be, but often it won't be. Yeah.